Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for a talk by Mel Russell titled Warriors, Women of Yolo County and the Struggle for Suffrage in honor of Women's History Month, this last day of Women's History Month. So before we get started with our program, we should take a moment to acknowledge that this virtual program is taking place throughout the unceded territory of California, home to nearly 200 tribal nations. As we begin this event, we acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our various regions. A land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with native communities to secure meaningful partnership and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and homelands. Let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have sown worldwide. Yolo County is on the traditional unceded territory of the Yochadehe Wintu Nation. Next, I wanted to point out to you that you should all see a chat and Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. So please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A section. And um, we'll address as many questions as we can at the end of the discussion. Also, um, Mel wanted me to let you know that a number of the slides are We'll be moving fast. She's gonna be talking pretty quickly, but feel free to type questions about any of the slides and we can go back to them at the end of the presentation. Okay, so let's get started by introducing our guest, Mel Russell. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Mel was born in London, England in 1948. She graduated with a double major in history and physical education from Digby Stewart College, University of London. Prior to starting her teaching career, she took some time off to travel around the world. Whilst in San Francisco, she met her husband, Michael, and never made it back to England. So after taking early retirement, she joined the Yolo County Library as a substitute, and in 2000 was appointed the Yolo County Archives and Record Center Coordinator, where she served for 10 years. After retiring from the archives as a volunteer, she designed a traveling display for the library's 100th anniversary. And since 2014, March, sorry, since 2014, Mel has been volunteering for the Lest We Forget project commemorating Yolo County's participation in the First World War. Mel has held many presentations throughout the county communicating the story of all those who served both at home and away during the Great War and continues her research today. So thank you again, Mel, and um, feel free to take it away. Okay, thank you, Heather, and uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so it was the West that would lead the way in the battle for women's rights in America. The first four states to provide full suffrage to women were Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and Idaho. The women of these states had traveled across the plains and shared all the trials and tribulations of homesteading, building businesses, and creating communities as equal partners with their husbands. The gold rush of California was mainly a male event, and the early activists who traveled around the state making speeches and raising funds did so in support of the national suffrage movement. And in fact, both uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth C. Stanton um, uh, key workers on the in the suffrage movement both came out here in 1871 and toured the state for the same reason. The first real attempt to change the constitution in, was in 1879 when um, the citizens put a petition out which could only be signed by men, of course, uh, to change the wording of the constitution. Uh, the, the men had been given, white men had been given the vote, all white men, and women wanted the word men changed, dropped entirely, but not necessarily the word white. So that uh, effort failed, not enough support. In 1883, Frances Willard of the Women's Christian Temperance Union came out to Woodland to start a chapter. Now the WCTU was an organization that perceived alcohol abuse to be a part of a larger social problems. 
It embraced many progressive social reforms, such as child labor laws, prison reform, international peace, an eight hour day, and of course, women's suffrage along with prohibition. So uh, the one thing that Miss Willard did that was of importance to YOLO was to select Emily Hoffin to be the first president of the YCTU. Emily was an energetic pioneer to the state and county and ferocious in her search for social justice. She was actually called the most brilliant woman in California. A first class writer and an orator, she was to be a champion for suffrage, not just in YOLO, but throughout the state. So uh, under her leadership, um, there were uh, unions formed throughout the county. And this is the front page of uh, the Davis uh, group. And you can see that I've highlighted some of the names and that's because these women were all uh, pioneering farming families that were instrumental in starting and developing Davis. And this was true in all the communities of the county. Each small community had its own WCTU and those women were the powers that be. And in fact, the county was getting an army of workers ready to help with all of the social ref reforms that the WC2 standard for. Good for. <laughs> so the next real effort to change the constitution was in 1893. The bill actually passed, but the governor vetoed it as being unconstitutional. Anyway, finally, in 1896, the um, efforts of all the women through the state led to a referendum being placed on the ballot. And what happened was, excuse me, uh, the National Suffrage uh, Association sent out speakers to help with that campaign. And this is uh, Naomi Anderson, an African-American suffrage worker who campaigned up and down California for the movement. But here in YOLO, um, Ms. Hopkin, Mrs. Hopkin had four workers of equal value. Um, the first one was Emma Lovenauer. Emma was actually the mother of the suffrage movement in YOLO. She had been uh, working on it since uh, the 1860s and was uh, instrumental in making sure that all women got support uh, that she knew. She was uh, well loved throughout the county. And as a result, she was selected to attend uh, the state organizing uh, meetings down in San Francisco. So that was her role in this particular campaign. Sir, her sister-in-law, Sarah Laganau Houston was, um, the editor and publisher of the Home Alliance, which was a, a local newspaper that followed the um, divisions of the WCTU's social agenda. It also, um, also uh, covered social and local and legal news, and it was paid for by Emma. So, uh, the thing about Sarah was that she was active in many civic uh, groups and affairs, and she was particularly involved in the volunteer fire department, which was all male. But uh, the women here were beginning to connect with uh, all kinds of groups. They were beginning to network as a result of their um, campaign. The next uh, woman I wanna talk about is Lydia Lawhead, who was a teacher 
She helped found the Woodland High School and by, by 1903 was actually the vice principal of the school. And um, in 1915, she was uh, to become the first woman to serve on the Board of Trustees for Woodland. Her role during this campaign was to help all the speakers that came through, make sure they had a place to stay and, and make arrangements for uh, where they would talk. The youngest member of this group was Dr. Francis Newton. Uh, what was special about Dr. Francis is that she had, was a graduate from the Women's Medical College, which was very rare at that time, but even rarer was for a woman, woman to actually practice medicine. So um, she came back to Woodland and set up her practice here in town and she was considered a core member of the medical group. Um, her, her interest in medicines uh, was equaled by her co total commitment to the women's suffrage movement. Now, these five pioneering women were patriotic, passionate, progressive, highly educated, and most of all, persuasive because after, after all, it was the men that were going to vote. The women couldn't do that. So we had to persuade the men um, that suffrage was in their best interest. They were all eloquent speakers and organizers. They were the leaders and they were going to be the champions of this campaign. Now, it wasn't just these five women. As I said, the WCTU um, got all of their local uh, groups involved and churches also got involved. The uh, African-American church women, 20 of them got together, started their own suffrage club, and they went on to hold meetings in the YMCA and as well as their church that were very well attended and uh, uh, very well done. So the national organization was really uh, interested in how things would go in California. So they sent Mrs. Carrie Chapman Cat, one of the uh, foremost uh, suffragettes at the time. And uh, so the whole campaign, eight months, was all out effort by these women. So it was quite an emotional shock when uh, on November 3rd, 1896, it fell, and it fell drastically. In San Francisco, it was defeated uh, by uh, four, over 4,000 votes, which was a lot at the time. So um, the women were emotionally, uh, thrown off course and it was years before they really got themselves back together again. Uh, they really had uh, worked so hard, but they did analyze why it hadn't been successful, what had gone wrong. So um, they had failed to get the newspapers behind them. Now you have to realize the context and the time there were no radio, there was no television, of course, no internet, internet no Facebook, no um, Instagram, no Twitter, everything media wise came through the, the newspapers. The newspapers were your source of getting your argument out and both main newspapers, Northern California being the San Francisco Chronicle, and Southern California, the LA Times, both of those refused to endorse the measure. And without those, they really didn't have much uh, hope of having the measure passed. Uh, the other uh, key element against them was the power of the liquor lobby. Um, and, and by power, I actually mean the money, the liquor uh, interests uh, poured millions of dollars into the campaign to defeat it. And it was in uh, the centers like LA and San Francisco where the breweries were that um, the, the referendum was defeated badly. 
Uh, but even up here in uh, Woodland, uh, at that time, we only had 3,100 people in town, 3,100 people. There were 17 saloons. So uh, liquor was an important uh, part of the equation that women were going to have to overcome. So like I said, this was an emotional blow. And in fact, there was no activity on the national level or state or local level uh, until 1910, a gap of over 10 years. Two things happened in 1910 to change the atmosphere. One was the women of the state of Washington, God bless them, got the vote. The second one was that here in California, the progressive Republicans won the November election of 1910, and they took over the government in Sacramento uh, with suffrage on their agenda, on their platform. So with the progressive movement in full swing at that time in California, partly because of all the work the WCTU was doing, uh, California suff suffragettes felt that this was uh, a time that was ripe for another try. So who were these women that were so bold, you know, so adorable, uh, uh, they can't say it, so bold, as to want the vote. This is going well, isn't it? Anyway, so bold as to want the vote. Who were, were they? And what did society expect of them in 1911? Well, at this time, women were still expected to be chaste, dis discreet, and submissive to their husbands. They were generally thought to be the weaker sex and dependent on men. Their primary roles was to be mothers, wives, homemakers. So uh, this headline is from an article from the Yolo Independent, which was a West Sacramento paper and uh, was anti-suffrage movement. And uh, the headline there says, um, be tender, true, and ladylike. And the rest of it goes on to say, remember, your station in life is to be loved and petted and cared for. Don't be mannish, for no man will love you then. So you have to be ladylike or else you weren't going to be married. And if you weren't married, you really had no role in life. So um, it was a warning to all these new women that were up and coming. So if we look at the picture on the left, that's actually from 1911. It's YOLO, a farm in YOLO, and it's a group of women that, that were getting together. And they do look rather uh, chaste and discreet in their white, lovely dresses. But if you look closely, and I know it's kind of hard, the younger ones look uh, fairly athletic, I think. And on the right here, you actually see a basketball team from Winters from that time frame. So women were not, the new woman was not conforming to this image that men still had of her. And remember, we were uh, a, count, a county that was uh, filled with pioneering women that had come across the plains, had come by Panama, around the Horn, had come through Nicaragua to reach our county. Women like uh, Agnes Bremley on the left, she was from Dunnegan, widowed with five children. She still managed to successfully farm thousands of acres in the county. The woman in the middle was Mrs. Freeman. She came and was a teacher in a one room schoolhouse. But uh, later when she married her husband, she helped him found and develop the town of Woodland. And the woman on the right was a widow, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Weber from Germany. She traveled by herself from Germany to Yola with two children. And she eventually had a, a vineyard and an orchard on the west side of town. These were no shrinking violets. These were women that had worked to earn their place within society. They were local leaders like um, Mrs. Baker of uh, Winters. 
Jenny Reed of Davis and Mrs. Uh, Gillum of Madison, a farmer's wife, all hardworking. They were wives that shared their husband's duties. Miss, on the left is Mrs. Dixon, sorry, Mrs. Dixon from uh, Knight's Landing. Her husband was the doctor there. She was a nurse and they had equal uh, weight within their partnership and they became actually the local leaders of that whole area. And on the right is Edith Martha Morse who worked with her husband in Clarksburg. These were all women that worked. They were also now daughters. We need to remember we've gone into the next generation and what's significant there is that um, Yolo County being very rich, we had uh, earned, made a lot of money uh, with grain. That's how we ended up with all those lovely Victorian homes in Woodland. And that allowed families, farming families to move into town, but also gave them money to educate not just their sons, but their daughters. So we see people like the Millsap daughter, and this is uh, Mrs. Cross daughter, who uh, uh, go to college, come back, become teachers, professionals. And the teachers would go out throughout the whole community and educate uh, people on the suffrage movement. And we were becoming to be uh, just professionals, librarians and nurses, entrepreneurs. This is Mattie Manchester in West Sac. She owned her own store and ran it. There's Sarah Bratton from Winters in her um, hat store, her millinery store. These were women that stood on their own two feet. They were not uh, just housewives. On the left here, we have Jackie Grieve, who was from Davis. She co-owned the hotel there and ran it. And on the right, we have Mrs. Cranston from Woodland. As we all know, her and her husband started a hardware store from scratch and built it up to um, one of the most important businesses in the county. And women were beginning to take over traditional working roles from men too. We had uh, retail clerks. On the right, we have some clerks from CB's candy store on the uh, uh, main street of Woodland. In Davis, the post office was run by women. In winters, the new telephone uh, office was ran by women. And so uh, we also had students and alumni that were going to become, become part of our army of troops that would go out and lead the charge for this, uh, this new campaign. Uh, students were important. We had a, a very strong connection with Mills College, which was an all women college but also the University of California only had one campus at the time, and that was at Berkeley. And so we had women going there too. So we, we, we had educated young girls, all working, all willing to work towards this campaign. So the bulk of the leaders of the suffrage movement was going uh, in YOLO was to come from the WCTU membership and from the women's clubs that had become prevalent within the county. The earliest, the Shakespeare Club shown here, worked, worked uh, actively to help improve the lot of women and children in the community. So they were not just social clubs. They were clubs where women could come together and discuss the issues of the day and learn how government worked. And again, I've highlighted some names from this membership list from our time frame because all of these were leaders in the suffrage movement. These clubs gave women a forum for their political and social voices in a safe environment. They were also able to develop their organizational and leadership skills. And they also had to interact, interact, interact with the media. Uh, the newspapers supported these groups. 
And so we were, fun, uh, we were put in a foundation of a very strong network out there. This was reinforced in 1900 when California joined the Federation of Women's Clubs. This was an organization that allowed all the clubs, small and large, from all parts of California to come together. Um, they had a conference every year. They would decide on issues they wanted to work on, social issues, and uh, they could speak one, with one very strong voice. Now, YOLO was uh, so far advanced with our women's clubs that um, every year many of the officers actually came from YOLO and Emily Hoppin and Lydia both served as presidents for the club. Now, I really can't emphasize enough just how rural YOLO County was in 1910. The census gave us just under 14,000 people. Now we're a county of a thousand square miles. So um, very rural. And uh, we were still homesteading. We were still trying to encourage immigration into our county as was the whole of California at the time. So the railways um, try encouraged uh, women to start improvement clubs. Now these clubs were designed to beautify and upgrade communities. And in 1902, YOLO got uh, one in Woodland and one in Winters. The Woodland one's first uh, impact was to actually fund the um, development of a city park. There hadn't been any uh, open space like that in the town. So they funded that, got that going. They also worked very hard uh, with the library, the local library association. In winters, the women there uh, actually purchased the land on which this beautiful city hall is sitting on. Um, they also uh, helped fund the library and they uh, tried to get water fountains in the city, which was quite a technical feat at the time. In 1904, we got two more improvement clubs. Uh, Knight's Landing, uh, this is the snowball mansion on the left in Knight's Landing. The club there held a huge picnic on this lawn, which is by the river, and they used the funds uh, they raised to actually irrigate their cemetery, which was one of the oldest in the county. They also uh, got funds to ensure that the um, small as the town was, that uh, they had a library branch very early on. On the right is Gwinda. I don't have a picture of what the women did there. What they did was build a community hall. And um, uh, this was significant for the whole of the northern part of the Cape Valley. It became a hub. And the women, that particular women's group was very active and very influential with the men there. And uh, they did a lot of dinners, a lot of fundraising for local events. So in 1905, Davis finally got their little uh, club. Here's a, a lovely picture though of the members. Um, they uh, are probably most well known for a, uh, funding the building of this arch, the Davis Arch, which was supposed to be a gateway into the city, but you are looking at the city through the gateway. So that shows you how rural Davis still was. Um, but the main thing these women really did that had the most effect was they upgraded the sanitary conditions in the city and the town because it really was rather backwards at the time. So, these women have been working hard. They've been working with each other. They've been working with um, the, the men of their communities. After all, it was the men that helped build many of these things. And so uh, Yolo County was looking pretty strong on this uh, suffrage front. And in 1910, as it happened, the WCTU celebrated 24 years and they voted as a group 
to make su suffrage their main goal for the next year. Now, Women's Christian Temperance Union, the Christian meant that uh, uh, it was closely aligned with all of the churches in the county. And if you look at any of the women's groups, like on the left, this is the Winter's Bible Club. On the right is the Samora group of ladies from their church. They are almost identical to the local WCTU group. So uh, very much a close uh, mirror organizations. Uh, so much so that uh, it wasn't just the women, the congregation also uh, in most cases supported suffrage and the pastors even gave talks on it. And uh, this particular one was kind of fun because um, the pastor of the Methodist Episcopal Church shown here, um, took as a, a topic the taming of the shrew and, and applying it to uh, the subject of women's suffrage and asking the question, is it a question of women's rights or a question of women's wrongs? So why did women still have to fight to get the vote? What were the, the arguments against it? against it at the time. Well, the main one was that woman was too physically weak, mentally frail, and emotionally fraught. So uh, they just lacked the mental and physical ability to do more than one thing at once. As our local in uh, YOLO independent mentioned, they lacked the mental and physical ability to be both mothers and politicians. However, we do have an answer here. The lady says she can handle both. She's got a cradle up here at the top and she's got the world over here. Given that women wanted to step out of what was perceived to be their sphere, which was uh, home and family, there was a suggestion that then they would neglect their children. This was a big argument. And um, Senator Sanford actually said, a suffragette is a woman who wants to raise hell, but not children. And this image here on the right was used in many different kinds of cartoons. And what it reflects is that um, the woman starts in love, gets married, has children, is really happy, then finds a career. Hello, she begins to go up the ladder, be successful which can only lead to dis disappointment, which then of course will lead to suffrage. And finally you will have strife, anxiety and loneliness. And the further up she goes, of course, the further removed she is from her family and particularly the, ch uh, the children. So this, this uh, separation from her family duties would cause confused gender roles, lead into what they called the masculine woman. There were lots of uh, cartoons uh, demonstrating that woman in many ways, uh, not very attractive. And again, our local paper, the YI says, woman is woman. She cannot unsex herself. Let the manly man and the womanly woman defeat this amendment. So, and if you have a, a manly woman and she's going out and working and, and uh, uh, getting the vote, well, that can only lead to the hempecked husband. It can only lead to uh, the man having to stay home and look after the children. And I, this is a particularly uh, fun one because uh, it ties into our time of year right now, Easter. <laughs> to me, but um, it, wa it was uh, typical that a, a woman was seen to lose her, her femininity if she uh, tried to get the ballot. Another argument was because uh, politics was a dirty game. Um, and in fact, again, our nice local paper, the YOLO Independent says, 
too much similarity between the ballot and the diaper. That's a pretty straightforward uh, comparison. Over here in the cartoon, we have the corrupt, corrupt polit politician hand in the anti uh, suffrage woman her sword on which is uh, printed a woman's places in the home because there were women who were against uh, getting the vote. And they, they claimed it was because they were too busy with home and family. They thought it might have an adverse impact on their own lives. They thought it would complicate government to have both women and men trying to run uh, things. And least but last but not least, some women actually thought that woman was not capable of making political decisions. Underlying all of this, of course, was uh, prohibition interests. Um, and again, the Yolo Independent, when there was an anti-saloon meeting in Woodland, said that uh, they were going to be regaled with bunches of flap doodle by a parcel of hired agitators. It was going to be a whole week of rot and nonsense. So those were the arguments about for why a woman couldn't vote. So how did uh, the women respond? Well, the first one is, it's just just. If you have 50% of the population um, with some power, the other 50% really should be equal with that. After all, women are people too. And I just want to read what Dr. Frances Newton said about this. In one of her articles, uh, the local newspapers allowed our women to run columns every day, and they were copied throughout the county. And Do uh, Dr. Frances Newton was the main writer. And she said to this subject, Women are as much affected by political affairs as are men. They suffer from bad government just as men do. They must pay taxes just as men do. They are consumers, and consumers need full representation in politics. They are citizens of the government, and women are people. So um, this is a cartoon that Emily Hoppin ran in August of 1911 on the front of the white ribbon ensign there. Um, this is uh, the politician saying, let people rule. Down here are the people, all white males. Over here, animals. And the women are asking, what are we if we're not people? Now, women were always upset that they were, along with idiots, criminals, the insane, and ethnic people that were marginalized, like Native Americans and uh, Chinese, they were not allowed to vote. So they were over here on the margins of society. But women were ready to vote. They were ready to stand up and fight for social justice. And um, in winters, the newspaper editor there let Miss Edna Dexter uh, have a column every week. And this is uh, one where she's addressing white slave uh, traffic. Uh, each week, she would pick one of the social issues. Uh, the disclosures of the white slave traffic are hideous beyond description. All the more hideous because of the youth of the victims. So the white slave traffic was prostitution, which was rampant in America at the time. And it was young girls, eight, nine, 10, 11 on the street. So the women were saying, we will clean up the dirty, filthy politics. Give us a chance. We'll get uh, the broom or we'll get the shovel and we'll just clean all that stuff up. And they, they said it's because they are pure, because they were not uh, part of the uh, corrupt uh, politician system that they would be able to get things done and change society. 
Still, men saw themselves as defenders of the home and family, but it was the women, claimed Emily in the white ribbon and sign, that were really uh, protecting the children. They weren't the ones uh, drinking in, in the saloons and gambling away all the money for, from the family. Another argument that actually went very well here, Emily Hopping was uh, very keen on this argument. She actually wrote a paper about it. Um, was taxation without representation? Um, and this was um, uh, got to the core of the fact that uh, many of our women were uh, in, in, in a good percentage of our women were Yolo County property owners. So uh, one last uh, ar argument our women had was to the women that uh, were against suffrage was that they were out of touch with reality. Many of these women were uh, middle class uh, who had never had to go out and do a day's work and so failed to understand, understand or even see the social inequities that were going on. So 1911 was going to be the time for women in California. So the government passed the Senate Constitutional Amendment number eight in February, and it was put on to the ballot for October 10th, a special election. Uh, there was a number of amendments, progressive amendments uh, on that. Uh, ballot and the question was very simple I like this they just asked should women be allowed to vote that's all the men had to say yes or no so so one thing the women had learned from the 1896 campaign was that they weren't very organized in a central way so they uh, did form a central campaign committee who tried to pull all the counties together with uh, how they were going to go forward. One of the things they um, said was that visibility was going to be of the highest priority. They had their own publishing uh, company and they flooded the state with flyers and, and posters. They uh, told local women that they needed to pull on plays, to do speeches, to do parades, to wear buttons, to sing songs. So they tried to make uh, each county feel that they had to be deeply involved in this campaign. They also told each county that they needed to get the local, local media on board. And we were ahead of the game there, of course. Um, the, the organizers said that small town papers exert a great educational influence in California, which was very true. But we were ready to go, as I said. On the left here, we have Ed Leak. I want to say Leaky, but apparently it's Leak. And he was the editor for the uh, Woodland Daily Democrat. He allowed columns to run and he wrote editorial, editorial supporting the movement. Uh, in the middle is Fred Hemingway. He was the editor for the Winter's Express, where we saw Edna had a column every week, uh, very supportive, of course. And on the right, we have W.H. Scott of Davis. And he, too, was very, very much behind the movement. I don't have a picture of Mr. Mixon, who was the male of Woodland, editor at the time, he and his wife, Mrs. Mixon, spearheaded the charge on the media front. But the main uh, decision that was made by the Central Committee was that the focus was going to be on rural versus urban voters. They decided they weren't going to be able to defeat the liquor interests in San Francisco and LA. And so what they were going to aim for is to win every single vote out there in the rural counties, in the safe counties. So um, we, as I said, were very rural. We only had 14,000 people, but we were ready. We had our battle-tested leaders. We had our army of activists ready behind them. 
we had the media uh, in our arsenal, we had superb speakers able to spearhead this charge. So we were ready. Another decision that was taken was that the WCTU would not really highlight this effort as an organization. They asked their workers to, to each as an individual support it, to campaign for it, but not to do it necessarily under the WCTU. They were trying to minimize um, the temperance part of their organization. So we were ready. So the central organization sent up a Mrs. Spencer in March and i would highlighted all of the women that met with her. And of course, our five champions are there, Francis Newton, Mrs. Lawhead, uh, E.C. Laganauer, S.A. Houston, Emily Hoppin, and a few others. And they formed um, a women's suffrage club here and the, the campaign was off. Mrs. Lawhead was voted the president, all the other ladies were uh, her lieutenants, uh, secretary, treasurer, etc. Now, Emily Hoppin um, was not just uh, working in the county. She was so well known. She was asked to give speeches up and down California. She actually wrote a specific speech for that tour on women's suffrage and uh, she was highly effective uh, when she gave her speeches. She also went down in May to the California Federation of Women's Conference. Now, there were a lot of conservative women in California and they belonged to clubs. So when they had this yearly conference, the question came up, should the uh, Federation uh, support, wholly support equal suffrage? Should they say nothing or should they come out against it? And Emily Hoppin was one of the few, one of the main speakers for supporting the suffrage. And after her speech, they took a vote and it passed handily. This was important for small clubs because it gave them the support of the uh, main, main organization. The churches were uh, contacted by the women of WCTU and asked to put on a suffrage day. And one of the pastors says, either woman is like a man, in which case she is ine inevitably entitled to all the rights and privileges that a man has, or she is unlike man, in which case it is impossible that any man should speak for her without her consent. You know, we were very forward speaking. So um, the three main people uh, in this particular campaign were Mrs. E.C. Loganauer, Emily Hoppin, and Francis Newton. And what they did for the next two months, two and a half months, is travel around the county to every community forming little suffrage uh, association. So they went to Rumsey, Gwinder, Cape Madison, Winters, Knights Landing, Blacks, Dunnigan, Davis. The only place I don't see where they went was um, Clarksburg. And in each community, um, they knew already who the most influential woman was and they would go to her, they would go to her friends and set them up as the leaders of the suffrage movement in that area. So now we're down to the last five weeks of the campaign. Uh, things are beginning to get hot. And uh, the Central Committee sends Jeanette Rankin, who was one of the main suffragettes at the time, out to YOLO to speak. She arrived on September 1st. This was a deliberate move on the Central Committee's part. They considered YOLO safe, but they wanted to get every single men's vote that they could. So um, Miss Rankin was met by Jackie Greed. This is the uh, Buena Vista Hotel where uh, Jackie took care of Miss Rankin. And Miss Rankin in her uh, talk said she, she didn't want to, to begin warfare in a hostile community. 
she was glad her first opportunity to address the people of YOLO was at Davis. It was a very successful uh, talk. And I just want to take a moment to explain how uh, many of the speeches were given during this campaign. Um, uh, Miss Ida Mackerel, who was a San Francisco uh, suffragette, noticed that many men, even those that supported uh, the effort, didn't want to go into churches and halls that were um, giving suffragette meetings. And so she suggested that uh, if the men wouldn't come to the women, the women would go to the men. And so they took an automobile out to the uh, street corners and started giving speeches. And that grew out uh, into the county. So um, the national speakers would be put into automobiles, taken out to county communities. They would meet up with the local leaders who would tell them that's the corner you need to be on. And that's where they would give their talks. And it was a smashing success. They reached a lot of men that otherwise would never have heard the arguments. So Miss Rankin um, spent four and a half days in YOLO. She went uh, uh, up the Cape Hay Valley and over to Winters when she was in Winters, for instance. Edna was the person that made the arrangements for where she should uh, have her talk and the same in all these other little communities. The largest event to happen was on September 9th when um, uh, Francis had uh, Dr. Francis Newton set up a meeting in Woodland and Mr. Mixon and his wife worked on this. He was the presenter and they followed every, all the tenants that the central committee had said. They made it a huge event. They uh, hired the local band. They had all the business uh, shops in town decorate um, themselves in the color of the movement, which was this gold yellow. Um, and they say 4,000 people uh, came out. Again, the town only had 3,100. So that is an immense crowd. That's a very successful event. So we were looking pretty good. Now the speaker at that event was Ada Mackerel, the she of the automobile idea. And she and Emily Hopkins went around the county again. And I just show you Knight's Landing at the time. Just look how rural we really are. And they went up to Yolo. They went back to Gwinda. They came down to set, uh, Winters again. So most of these communities were visited by very well-known speakers two or three times during this five-week period. In winters, it even says they spoke from an automobile in front of Judy's uh, livery stable, which is uh, actually pioneer stable in this picture. The local papers had done everything they could. YOLO Independent, everything they could to fight the amendment and all the other papers to um, ad advance the amendment. And um, so they had given columns, they'd written editorials, but they also uh, ran cartoons and uh, national from national sources. And I just love this one because it's national suffrage. This woman's trying to do her little buttons there. And down here it says the last few buttons are always the hardest. Well, I think this is a subliminal uh, message here because as most women know, when you're zipping up your dress or you're trying to do those last few buttons and you can't do it, who do you call? You call your husband or your partner and they finish the job for you. So this was saying to the men of YOLO, you need to get out and vote for this amendment. Jeanette Rankin came back through uh, October 3rd and now we're in the last week prior to the vote. Um, the Home Alliance was a weekly paper published on Thursday. So this was its last um, uh, cover. And it's the liquor interests of seeing the shadow of suffrage coming for them. Uh, Dr. Frances Newton uh, addressed the men directly in her, one of her last columns. It is to the fair-minded, clean-souled men that the women must look victory at the polls. 
After making their splendid fight since last February, we are depending on you. So we're getting there. It's almost over. The Independent was a weekly uh, every Friday. So their last headlines right across the paper was vote no on every amendment. There. Let's keep the status quo. No change here. Everything's honky dory. The uh, Mail of Wood Woodland ran this. W woman should vote. She is mother and teacher um, supporting the amendment. So finally, finally, <laughs> October 10th, 1911 rolled round and the men of California were going to go to the ballot and decide if, women, if the women of the state would be allowed to vote. Three generations of California and Yola women had fought to overcome objections and convince the male voter that they should have the vote. So like today, most of the first votes came in from the larger cities. And for two days, uh, women uh, were seeing the numbers go against them. In fact, the headline from the Home Alliance itself, October 12th, two days later said, defeated. And in fact, in San Francisco, it was soundly beaten. It was... Um, uh, beaten by 5,000 votes, which was more than the 1896 campaign. So these poor women were already beginning to think about the next campaign. They were convinced that they had lost. All the papers said so. But slowly, surely, favorably returns started coming in from the smaller communities, from the ranches, the farms, the far counties up north and south. And the uh, amendment was actually passed with a margin of just 3,587 votes. Now that is a difference in voting that equaled one vote per print precinct. So I just want to take a moment. If you are ever, ever campaigning, I don't care if it's local, national, international, you must emphasize that every vote counts because in each precinct in California, just one vote swung the effort. So actually, how did we do? How did YOLO do? How did YOLO men do? Well, this is from our Board of Supervisor records and we're looking at column four because it was the fourth proposition, Amendment 8. We have 16 precincts. So the results are by precinct. Blacks, yes, 21. No, 38. Cashville, yes, 29. No, 54. Cape Valley, yes, 56. No, 24. Clarksburg, yes, 22. No, 17. So it's pretty even on that page, but I have Cashville highlighted because they were fully expected to be in the yes column. So this was not good news. So how did we actually do? Well, out of 16 precincts, seven voted no, but nine did vote yes. And that uh, gave us a total of 166, sorry, 168 extra votes for the amendment. Now that turns out to be 4.8% of the total votes for California. So the central committee's idea that the rural uh, voter would be the swing voter turned out to be abs absolutely spot on, particularly here in uh, YOLO. So why did the warrior women of YOLO win, of the West win? Well, because the men voted for it. And they recognized that um, uh, Dr. Newton wrote to the enterprise and thanked him uh, profusely for supporting it. And at the bottom said to the men of Davis who gave their 69 votes, we also give our thanks and gratitude. Thursday, October 19th was a special day in YOLO. 
this is when over 400 women were able to go through the courthouse doors and register to vote for the very first time. Before the doors opened, uh, the woman that was in the front of the line noticed that Mrs. E.C. Lagenauer, now over 70 years old, was waiting to register and she very graciously went and brought her up to the front so that when the doors opened, she could lead these women into the courthouse for the very first time as uh, citizens with full rights. And this is a copy of one of our affidavits for registration. Emily registered on October 21st, 1911. So uh, the women celebrated the triumph, but they did continue plan to uh, continue their political works. And those men that were worried about prohibition, they were spot on because on December 12th, uh, Yolo County with women uh, pushing the vote, voted to go dry. That was a local option. So we had prohibition in 1911, all except for one district. I'll have you guess which one. Yes, District 1, where the Yolo Independent was loca uh, located, West Sacramento was the only wet district. The women gained uh, all over America, gained enthusiasm and renewed energy from the women in California, and they started moving towards a full suffrage when World War I interrupted that process. This is our friend Jeanette Rankin. She was the first woman voted into Congress, and her very first vote, unfortunately, was to be whether America entered World War I or not, a difficult choice for any suffragette. It actually split the um, movement in twos. Uh, some people said we sh uh, should not support the war, but others said support it because it will help us gain the enfranchisement, the suffrage, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, President Wilson in 1919 said the women had helped so much during World War I that they had to have the vote, they deserved the vote, they earned the vote, and it was ratified on August 18th, 1920. So there you are, I apologize for all my stumbling, there you are. I had technical difficulties with my other computer, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Mel. That was great. I think we probably all learned something. Um, I wanted to say quickly that I noticed that that really um, high number of no votes in the Cashville district, that was Emily Hoppin's district, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It it's was really a total surprising. shock. Yeah. And when they, I mean, when they were, um, you know, waiting for the results, but getting, you know, feedback, the, the women were just in shock. The county was in shock. The newspaper said surprising results. So, right. Um, so even though we were supposed to be safe, if we hadn't really campaigned as hard as we had, we could well have not uh, passed it. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, feel free to type in some questions if you guys have any. I did see one from early on in the presentation, Mel. Um, it's about the photograph that accompanied the Dr. Francis Newton slide. And the person's asking if that's if that picture was in Woodland, which I think is not no. true, right? No. Um, no. Where is that? And I do, yeah, I do apologize. My other computer that I was using to help a completely phased out on me. And no, that is actually the medical, um, uh, is that Pennsylvania? Um, yes. And of note there is that it, you can see in the picture, I think if I can get to it quickly, I don't want to spend too much time. Where is she here? Um, I wish I'd done this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can see in the picture, should I go to it here? Sure. Um, if it's not too much uh, of a hassle. Mm, backwards, yes. I'll just keep my finger on that. Okay. Um, well, maybe I won't. Uh, you can see it says Women's Hospital Dispensary for Women and Children. Uh, this medical um, 
college was the, uh, the second college to allow women to, uh, to attend. And uh, it, it's part of Drexel now, in case you're wondering. But um, it, was, uh, uh, it provided social uh, support all mm -hmm. over that part of, of uh, Philadelphia. It was quite famous for it. Um, taking too long. Yeah, I know it was very rare for women to be able to go to medical college. So well, it was even rarer to come back and practice that I found mm. extraordinary that these women would take here it is that these women would take, you know, it, it was a, a they had they faced a lot of opposition opposition um, in college from their male uh, fellow students. It, it was not an easy uh, ride once they got to college, but that they would do that and then come home and just be a housewife or whatever is extraordinary. So um, to me, but it was rare for um, the doctors, you know, the women doctors to come back and practice. And, and, and Frances Newton was uh, uh, very active in, all her career uh, with uh, particularly children. She was really focused on children. Yeah. Interesting. So we do have a, another question. Um, do you think the amendment would have been ratified sooner if they weren't tied to the temperance movement or did they need the organization of the temperance movement? It's kind of a double-edged well, sword. Yes, it's, it's, I, I would say it's 50-50. There's no doubt the temperance uh, union got it going. Uh, they brought awareness of social injustice to, you know, communities that maybe were protected from it. In rural YOLO, a lot of those issues didn't exist, for instance. Um, but they organized um, by being members. They got to go to conferences to ch uh, share educational uh, subjects. Um, but that is probably why they were defeated in 1896. It was such a strong tie. So they were very deliberate in 1911 to tone it down. In fact, they told the women the white ribbon was an um, was uh, what people would wear if they were abstaining from alcohol. So um, uh, the women would, if they were white ribbon women, they would walk around with this ribbon on their um, clothing and they were told during the campaign, take it off, don't wear that. Don't, you know, highlight that that's where you're coming from, temperance. So it's a good question, but yeah. I, I, who knows, hindsight, but I suspect it's both needed each other. And, uh, it, but it did pass because they subdued their presence in the mm -hmm. campaign. Do you happen to know, um, I was curious throughout the presentation as to where the funding was coming from. I, obviously the women's groups were doing a lot of the work, but I didn't know how they were funded. Do you have any idea? Um, it's a good question. I didn't really get into that. Locally, um, Mrs. Um, Lagenauer, uh had the money, she funded the Home Alliance and she funded a lot of the publications uh, and flyers, etc. Um, I didn't look on the state level to where the money came from, but by this time, like I was saying, these were the daughters. And so many of them had become professional women uh, or their parents were now quite well off. So there was quite a lot of money just within the women's groups themselves by this time. Um, but I'm sure there was other sources. I don't know. It didn't come from the liquor people. That's <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Um, why were, this is another um, audience question. So why were the rural areas more likely to vote yes than the cities? Was it just the liquor lobbies? Well, I think it goes back to why did the West have the first four states? Uh, these women did come uh, either with their husbands or, or got married uh, and shared all the trials and tribulations. Um, uh, whereas in, if you look at urban settings, there tends to be more single men who have more free time, who have more free money, and what do they spend it on? They gamble and they drink and they have a good time. So um, 
and and that is where the liquor companies were located so uh, a rural uh, society tended to be more uh, religious just more christian if you will and um so this wctu uh, reflect that rural people thought temperance was a good idea that social uh, norms should be followed so um, that's one reason and I do think if you've got somebody working beside you every day um, and, and they saw a lot of successful women we were as I said highlighted maybe not enough uh, but we had uh, Emily Hoppin was a first class fruit grower she was well known throughout the state not just uh, you know the county so these were not these were not uneducated in their business kind of women these were women that were go getters and it's hard to uh, not su uh, support them so i think that's why yeah um i have one final question i don't i don't see anything else coming in from the audience members but i was just curious if you had any um information or hypotheses as to why west sacramento was so i, I don't know if conservative is the right word but um it, i mean was it just proximity to sacramento and having a lot of people working railroad yeah. type jobs single yeah. men it was because again if you look at the population it's mainly single men and why are they there well they're working at the railway across the river uh, but the housing's cheaper just like today uh, the big city was more expensive so all they had to do was cross over the river into west sac and they could get single rooms or lodgings at a much cheaper rate that gave them more money they were skilled laborers they were earning a fairly decent wage for the time. And so, uh, I, you know, again, it was a built in uh, clientele for drink. So, uh, so that's why and, and, and unfortunately, uh, because it became the only wet district, the only place you could get alcohol um, during the depression, that area just got worse, seedier and seedier, uh, as there was people out of work, but still drinking. Uh, it wasn't conducive to the society of West Sac, actually, the history of West Sac. Well, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> um, I I'm wanted sorry. to, <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah. I, I'm the one who posed the question. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you again, Mel, really appreciate you taking the time and giving us all a bunch of information to chew on and learn more about the wonderful women of Yolo County and their contributions. Um, and I wanna thank everybody who stuck out, stuck it out and stayed for all of the questions and answers. And um, I hope you guys all have a great rest of your day and um, happy Women's History Month. Okay.